Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the HiMax Technologies Incorporated Second Quarter 2020 Earnings Conference Call. At this time, our participants are in a listen-only mode. Later, we will conduct a question and answer session, and instructions will follow at that time. If anyone should require assistance during the call, please press star then zero on your touchtone telephone. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. I would now like to turn the conference over to your host, Mr. Mark Schwallenberg from MZ Group. Thank you. Welcome everyone to HiMax's second quarter 2020 earnings call. Joining us from the company are Mr. Jordan Wu, President and Chief Executive Officer, Ms. Jessica Pan, Chief Financial Officer, and Mr. Eric Lee, Chief IR PR Officer. After the company's prepared remarks, we will we have allocated time for questions and a Q&A. If you have not yet received a copy of today's results, please email himx at mzgroup.us, access the press release on financial portals, or download a copy from HIMAX's website at www.himax.com.tw. Before we begin the formal remarks, I'd like to remind everyone that some of the statements in this conference call, including statements regarding expected future financial results and industry growth, are forward-looking statements that involve a number of risks and uncertainties that could cause actual events or results to differ materially from those described in this conference call. Factors that could cause actual events or results to differ materially from those described in this conference call include, but are not limited to, general business and economic conditions, the state of the semiconductor industry, market acceptance and competitiveness of the driver and non-driver products developed by HiMax, demand for end-use application products, the uncertainty of continued success in technological innovations, as well as other operational and market challenges and other risks described from time to time in the company's SEC filings, including those risks identified in the section entitled Risk Factors in its Form 20F for the year ended December 31st, 2019, filed with the SEC in March 2020. Except for the company's full year of 2019 financials, which were provided in the company's 20F and filed with the SEC on March 25th, 2020. The financial information included in this conference call is unaudited and consolidated and prepared in accordance with IFRS accounting. Such financial information is generated internally and has not been subjected to the same review and scrutiny, including internal auditing procedures and external audits by an independent auditor to which we subject our annual consolidated financial statements and may vary materially from the audited consolidated financial information for the same period. The company undertakes no obligation to publicly under update or revise any forward-looking statements, whether as a result of new information, future events, or otherwise. I will now turn the call over to Mr. Eric Lee. Eric, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody, for joining us. My name is Eric Lee, and I am the new Chief IRPR Officer. Joining, uh, joining me are Jordan Wu, our CEO, and Jessica Penn, our newly appointed CFO. On today's call, we will first review the HIMAX consolidated financial performance for the second quarter, followed by the third quarter 2020 outlook. Jordan will then give an update on the status of our business after which we will take questions. We will review our financials on both IFIS and the non-IFIS basis. The non-IFIS financial is good, shows share-based compensation and acquisition related charges. We pre-announced the preliminary key financial result for the second quarter on July 6, 2020 with revenue, gross margin, and the EPS all exceeding the guidance issued on May 7, 2020. Today, our reported result for the revenue, gross margin, and the EPS were all in line with the pre-announced result. For the second quarter, we recorded net revenues of 187.0 million, an increase of 1.3% sequentially, and an increase of 104 compared to the same period last year. 
the 1.3 sequential increase of revenue exceeded our guidance of a slight decrease with 5% quarter over quarter, high demand of large display driver for monitor and greater than expected shipment volume for both smartphone and the tablet contributed to the better than guided sales. Gross margin was 21.0%, exceeding the prior guidance between 20.2% to 20.6% due to a more favorable product mix among large display products. IFI's profit per diluted ABS was 0.8 cents, exceeding our guidance of a loss of 1.5 cents to 0.5 cents. Strong sales, uh, 0.5 cents. Strong sales improving gross margin and the lower than expected operating expense contributed to the better than expected earnings result. Now, IFI's profit per diluted ABS was 1.0 cents, exceeding our guidance of a loss of 1.3 cents to 0.3 cents. Revenue from large display driver was 59.5 million, down 3.1% sequentially and up 0.2 year over year. The sequential decline was driven by lower shipments into TV due to weakness in the global TV market, which are severely impacted by COVID-19 outbreak. TV segment revenue decreased 21.7% year over year. Offsetting the weakness in the TV segment was a surge in the demand of telework and online education tools that spurred the sales in our monitor and the notebook segment to an increase of around 60 0.0% year over year in Q2. Large panel driver IT accounted for 31.8% of total revenue for the quarter, compared to 332 in the first quarter of 2020 and 35.0% a year ago. Revenue for small and medium-sized display driver was 98.8 million, up 12.9% sequentially, and 20.9% year over year. The sequential growth was driven primarily by tablet and the smartphone sales, but offset by a decrease in the automobile segment. The strong year over year growth was attributable to remarkable tablet sales, especially our TDEI products for tablet. The segment accounted for 52.8% of total sales for the quarter compared to 47.4% in the first quarter of 2020 and 48.3% a year ago. Sales into smartphones were up 10.9% sequentially, but down 26.8% year over year. Our smartphone TDDI was up 69.0% sequentially and up 0.3% from the same period last year. Strength in the smartphone PDDI segment reflected customers' aggressive new product launch plan with our PDDI solution. We reported earlier that the launch of several customers' new smartphones with our PDDI solution inside were delayed because of the pandemic. Many of those projects started mass production in Q2, leading to the strong sequential growth. Sales of traditional DDICs for smartphones declined by 43.6% sequentially and were down 58.3% from the same period last year. Our traditional DDIC, which represents just 26.3% of the smartphone segment in Q2, declined significantly, a trend that was expected as we have repeatedly reported that the traditional DDIC was quickly being replaced by TDDI and the AMOLA for smartphone applications. We expect to see a short-term spike of traditional DDIC demand for smartphones during the third quarter, arising from orders from certain brand customers. However, Again, barring short-term fluctuations, we expect to see continuous decline 
in the traditional DDIC for smartphones. The ongoing COVID-19 pandemic has eroded worldwide smartphone market demand with a more than 10.0 expected decline during 2020, according to several research institutes. Despite this challenging condition, we expect to see smartphone PPDI sales in second half of 2020 due to a more diversified customer base, strong product roadmap, and enriched product portfolio. As anticipated, boosted by the strong momentum in both traditional discrete driver IC and the PPDI product line, tablet was the best performing product category of all in Q2, up 55.1% sequentially and 174.8% year over year. It represented around 23.0% of our total sales in Q2. We expect this product segment to continue to grow in the second half as the overall market for tablet look to remain robust thanks to work, work from home and online education demand. In addition, there is new demand for tablet DDDI, of which the sales were up 83.2 sequentially in Q2. A steam cell touch display is quickly becoming a new mainstream for Android tablets. Jordan will elaborate on the Outlook tablet DDDI in a few minutes. Boosted by demand for remote work and education, the revenue of traditional display IC, driver IC for tablet delivered a more than 40% sequential growth and more than 17.0 year over year in the second quarter. Specifically, we shipped more of the higher ASC IC with higher resolution and the cost packaging for large size green bezel tablets to a certain leading brand names. As expected, our driver IC revenue for the automotive application was down 15.2% sequentially as a result of global production and the car sales coming to a certain halt in most of the world. However, on a year-over-year basis, automotive driver IC revenue was up 0.1% despite the effects of the pandemic. Second quarter revenue from our non-driver business was 28.7 million, down 19.5 sequentially, but up 1.7 year over year. The sequential decrease was mainly due to significant shipment reduction of WLO products to an anchor customer and the lower engineering fee income for other non-driver products. Affecting the weakness in WLO, CMOS image sensors had higher revenue contribution from notebook and IP camera application for remote work and online education purposes. Non-driver product accounted for 15.4% of total revenue as compared to 19.4% in the first quarter of 2020 and 167 a year ago. Gross margin for the second quarter was 21.0% down 170 basis points sequentially, but up 150 basis points from the same period last year. The sequential decrease was caused by lower WLO shipment and weak automotive sales, two of, our, two of our higher gross margin products. A decline in the engineering fee received was also a factor behind the sequential decline year over year basis. It was up 1.5%, mainly due to a more favorable product mix with a more shipment of WROs and the TCOM products. Our ISIS operating expenses were 37.6 million in the second quarter, up 0.9% from the preceding quarter, but down 3.3% from a year ago. The year over year decrease was a result of the decreased salary and the traveling expenses. Now, ISRS operating expenses for the second quarter were 37.2 million, up 1.4% from the previous quarter, but down 3.2% from 
from the same quarter in 2019. IFI's operating margin for the second quarter was 0.9%, down from 12.5% in prior quarter, but up from minus 3.5% in same period last year. The sequential decrease was mainly due to lower gross margin. The year-over-year -year improvement was primarily a result of higher sales, better gross margin, and lower operating expenses. Second quarter, non IFIS operating profit was 2.1 million, or 1.1% of sales, lower from non IFIS operating profit of 5.3 million, or 2.9% of sales last quarter, but up from a minus 3.2% for the same period last year. IFIS profit for the second quarter was 1.4 million, or 0.3%. 8 cents per diluted ADS compared to the profit of 3.3 million or 1.9 cents per diluted ADS in the previous quarter and the loss of 5.2 million or 3.0 cents per diluted ADS a year ago. Second quarter non IFI profit was 1.7 million or 1.0 cents per diluted ADS compared to non-IFI's profit of 3.8 million or 2.2 cents per diluted ADS last quarter and non-IFI's loss of 4.8 million or 2.8 cents per diluted ADS for the same period last year. Turning to the balance sheet, we have 107.1 million of cash cash equivalent and other financial assets as of the end of June 2020 to 122.4 million at the same time last year and 126.6 million a quarter ago. The lower cash balance as of the end of the second quarter was mainly a result of a repayment of unsecured borrowing of 9.4 million and an operating cash outflow of 9.2 million during the quarter. On top of the cash position, restricted cash was 164.0 million at the end of the quarter, the same as preceding quarter and a year ago. The restricted cash is mainly used to guarantee the secure short-term borrowing for the same amount. We have 58.4 million of unsecured short-term loans as of the end of Q2 compared to 67.9 million a quarter ago and 77.0 million at the same time last year. Account receivables at the end of June 2020 were 206.1 million, up from 186.7 million last quarter and 176.2 million a year ago. DSO was 101 days at the end of the quarter as compared to 96 days a year ago and 92 days at the end of last quarter. Inventory of June 30, 2020 were 151.5 million, up from 148.4 million last quarter, but down from 188.5 million a year ago. In response to an industrial-wide capacity shortage and in preparation for a strong Q3 forecast, we had two increased inventory levels during Q2. We believe our inventory position in healthy, is healthy, giving solid forecasts and the purchase orders received from customers. While we monitor our inventory carefully by working closely with our customers, we will continue to build up our inventory position aggressively in the uh, foreseeable future given the prevailing severe foundry capacity shortage in the marketplace. We expect the inventory level to be significantly low over the course of Q3. Again, because of very tight foundry capacity and the strong customer demand. 
net cash outflow from operating activities for the second quarter was 9.2 million as compared to an outflow of 17.7 million of the same period last year and an inflow of 10.6 million last quarter. Net cash outflow was mainly caused by more aggressive inventory buildup. Second quarter capital expenditure amounted to 0.7 million versus 5.7 million a year ago and 3.1 million last quarter. As reported in the last earnings call, the capex for both new building construction and the 3D sensing capacity expansion were already concluded in the fourth quarter 2019. The second quarter capex was for R&D related equipment for our IC design business. Before concluding my report of the second quarter results, I would like to provide an update on dividend. We typically make annual cash dividend payment at the middle of the year based on prior year's uh, profitability. Our board of directors has decided that we will not pay cash dividend in two 2020. The decision was made with full consideration of HIMAX 2019 financial results as well as 2020 operation and capital requirement. As of June 30, 2020, HIMAX has 172.3 million ADS outstanding, little change from last quarter. On a fully diluted basis, the total number of ADS outstanding was 173.2 million. Q3, 2020 guidance. At this point, we expect to deliver strong growth for the third quarter. We see very good momentum in our smartphone TDDI business against the backdrop of a depressed global smartphone market. Our tablet ICs, both discrete driver and the TDDI made a remarkable contribution to our first half results and are on track to carry a nice momentum into second half. We also foresee decent growth for the notebook, TV, and the TCOM products for the next quarter. However, third quarter growth will be constrained due to an industrial-wide foundry shortage. Similar to our usual practice before 2019, we grant ISUs rather than stock options on September 30 this year for employees' share-based compensation. As a reminder, we did not grant ISU last year. Rather, 2,226,690 units of stock options were granted to the team at an exercise price of 2.27 last September. Our third quarter ISI's earnings per diluted ABS guidance has taken into account the expected 2020 ISU grant, which, subject to board approval, is now assumed to be around 3.0 million, or 1.3 cents per diluted ABS, almost all of which will be vested and expensed immediately on September 30, the grant date. The grant of ISUs would lead to higher third quarter IFI operating expenses compared to other quarters of the year. For the third quarter, we expect revenue to increase by around 20% sequentially. Gross margin is expected to be flat to slightly down for second quarter, depending on our annual product mix. IFI's profit attributable to shareholder is expected to be in the range around 2.0 cents to 2.8 cents per fully diluted ADS. Now, IFI's profit attributable to shareholders is expected to be in the range of 3.5 cents to 4.3 cents per fully diluted ADS. I will now turn the call over to Jordan. Jordan, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eric. 
While the COVID-19 does not look to be going away anytime soon, <coughs> most countries have greatly eased lockdowns while still taking measures to contain the spread of the virus. Although the pandemic has brought major disruptions to the markets we operate in, many of our panel customers have been fast to react to the changing environment by quickly shifting their production to where the demands are. What I reflected in our business is a very strong sales for notebook and monitor markets in the first half, with the momentum now switching to TV and smartphone. While tablet is set to stay robust throughout the whole year. <coughs> While businesses have been largely reopened, a big part of the society still stays mostly at home, with much of the activity being operated online. The stay-at-home economy has proven to benefit several uh, consumer electronics markets to which we supply our products. Our demand visibility has therefore been much improved from the first half. However, as Eric mentioned earlier, the industry is going through a severe foundry capacity shortage right now, which is limiting the growth in almost all of our businesses, especially the smartphone and tablet TDI, as well as CMOS immune sensor products. Separately, we are working towards capitalizing on our unique non-driver technologies where we have invested heavily in the past few years, notably 3D sensing for smartphone and smart door lock, as well as ultra-low uh, ultra ultra power smart image sensing for products such as notebook, TV, doorbell, and air conditioner. I will elaborate on this a bit later. As indicated in our guidance, we now expect a strong top line growth for Q3. Our next goal is to improve our gross margin. This will be an important target for Q4 and next year. <laughs> now let me take you through each of our major business areas. Let's start with the large, uh, large panel driver IC uh, business update. For the third quarter, we expect the large display driver IC revenue to decrease by high single digit sequentially, mainly due to weak demands for monitor ICs where our customers are going through an inventory adjustment after two quarters of strong shipments. However, TV and notebook ICs are picking up momentum in Q3. The TV market, our biggest uh, large display sector, is experiencing a solid rebound lately with panel prices rising and set makers rushing in for inventory replenishment after quite a few sluggish quarters. For the third quarter, we expect to deliver low teens growth for TV display driver both sequentially and year over year. For the monitor segment, follow a demand uh, following a demand surge in the previous two quarters, we expect customers' inventory to correct, resulting in a sequential decrease in Q3. In the notebook segment, as we mentioned earlier, we see continuous demand fueled particularly by enterprise and e-learning as we approach the back-to-school season. Our businesses in the high-end monitor and new-generation low-power notebook products where we are the market leader in DDIC and TCON, will benefit significantly from this trend. Now let's turn to the small and medium-sized display driver IC business, beginning with an update on our smartphone segment. Our TVDI product roadmap, as well as new design wins with end customers, positioned HiMax well to gain market share throughout two, uh, 2020. The pandemic has negatively weighed on both smartphone production and consumer demand. While 2020 remains a challenging year for the smartphone market, China is already gradually recovering and other countries are moving in the same direction. On the current pipeline, we expect to more than double our smartphone TVDI shipments uh, during Q3 compared to the previous quarter. 
the smartphone market continues to embrace new technologies, moving toward higher frame rate display to enable better screen viewing and gaming experience. Our high frame rate products have been adopted by several top tier customers and have begun mass production in Q2. As discussed previously, <coughs> the major development we are seeing in the marketplace is the increasing utilization of the OLED display for smartphones. This is due to expanded air molecular capacity as well as the increased demand for other display fingerprint technology that is only available in the air molecular display currently. We are encouraged by the progress we have made and are, collect and are collaborating closely with leading panel makers across China for air molecular product development. <coughs> Additionally, <coughs> We have made good progress in wearable AM OLED display driver ICs with leading Chinese panel makers. We believe AM OLED driver IC will soon become one of the major growth engines for small panel driver IC business. Turning to the tablet business, we expect our tablet IC to be a major growth area throughout 2020 with a strong focus for both discrete driver IC and 3DI in the third quarter. Tablet demand is picking up strongly in the wake of the COVID-19 outbreak that is fueling remote work and learning. As mentioned in previous earnings calls, Timex pioneered the 3DI solution for tablet and is the dominant supplier for literally all leading Android brand names. Tablet TDDI, just two quarters into mass production, already accounted for around 37% of our tablet IC sales, and uh, if looked at as a separate product category, represented almost 5% of our total revenues in Q2. We expect an increase of more than 20% sequentially for our tablet TDDI next quarter, with the momentum to continue into Q4. Tablet in-sale TVTI offers the benefits of lower cost and a simplified supply chain and represents an easier manufacturing process for panel makers. For consumers, it offers a lighter weight, slimmer, and more stylish design, as well as improved touch accuracy with added option for active stylus. Similar to smartphone, uh, demand for traditional uh, display driver IC for tablet is also being eroded by in sale TDDI, but at a more moderate pace. For the tablet segment, we expect to deliver another sequential growth of low teens with shipments to almost quadruple that of the same time last year. Again, this is thanks to the sudden surge of tablet demand arising from the pandemic and the new TDI revenue that did not exist last year. It is worth highlighting that while the tablet market is smaller than smartphone, the ASP and number of units for TDI in each tablet are both higher than those for smartphone. <coughs> Turning to the automotive sector, the global automotive sector has been badly hit by the COVID-19 and the market outlook remains uncertain during the second half of 2020. Hamas commands more than 30% of the global automotive DDIC market, and inevitably, this business is impacted by the slow uh, overall demand. However, while the sequential revenue was down 15.2% in Q2, revenue for the first half was still up 3.3% year over year. Our technology leadership in the automotive display market has helped us continue to gain ground with customers. We expect to deliver a single digit sequential increase in the third quarter. Then we will remain the leader in this market as the major developing trends have not changed amid short term challenges. <coughs> Backed by our leading market position in new technologies for auto automotive display, we have a strong and positive long-term outlook for the automotive segment. 
we are the primary partner for most of the world's automotive panel makers to enable new technologies. <coughs> Specifically, HIMAX has been selected by many leading Tier 1 and OEMs for the upcoming first launches of vehicles using displays with TDI technology. While we only expect a small volume of shipments in 2020, we anticipate meaningful full production shipments of automotive TDI as we move into 2021. <coughs> for the third quarter, revenue for the small and medium-sized driver IC is expected to increase by over 40% sequentially. Now, let me share some of the progress we made on the non-driver IC businesses in the last quarter. <coughs> First, on the WO business. The second quarter of the real revenue declined sequentially due to lower shipment to an anchor customer. The factory uh, to which we usually ship this product was ordered to shut down temporarily by the local government as part of their disease containment measures. However, our shipment to the anchor customer recorded a nice growth compared to the, to the same quarter last year. We continue to engage several strategic customers and or partners to develop new projects for DOE, diffuser, and optical lens solutions for future generation products covering a wide, a wide range of different applications. <coughs> Next is, is, is an update on the 3D sensing business. In smartphone application, most customer inquiries and design projects are moving towards TOS 3D sensing for wall-facing camera that features long range and wider um, angle coverage for AR, 3D modeling, and gaming features. With TOS, we provide optical components and or projectors, which are critical in the performance of the whole TOS solution. In this business, we have partnerships with TOS sensor providers, laser vendors, and smartphone makers and are engaged for various stages of product development for next generation smartphones. <coughs> for non smartphone 3D sensing engagements, we focus on smart door lock and payment system applications where we provide structured light based 3D sensing total solutions. To broaden our market reach, we also offer our market leading 3D decoder ASIC as an individual component for integration into others' systems. Through such partnerships, we are able to reach out to markets that we are not yet familiar with, such as industrial robotics and access control systems. 3D sensing remains one of the main growth drivers uh, for us. <coughs> now, switching gears to the wise eye smart sensing solution. As I mentioned in the last earnings call, in order for our Wi-Fi technology to reach its maximum potential, we have adopted a flexible business model whereby, in addition to a total solution where we provide processor, image sensor, and AI algorithm, we also offer those individually as key parts in order to address the market's different needs and widen our market coverage. For customers, who own their own algorithm and wish to develop their own applications, we can provide our actual low power AI processor and image sensor with our algorithm. The customers can piggyback on our technology and focus their efforts on bringing AI to edge devices by transforming a wide range of sensor data, including video, sound, movement, gesture, among others into actionable information, all with extremely low power consumption. For those consumers slash partners uh, whose main business is to provide AI processors, we can offer our ultra low power image sensors with our AI processor and algorithm. <coughs> For the total solution offering, we launched a computer vision human detection MV solution which has been well recognized and is being incorporated, incorporated into the next generation premium notebook models of TOEMs and ODMs. 
our total solutions are also being integrated into a wide range of other applications, such as TV, doorbell, door lock, air conditioner, etc., by engaging leading players in those industries. For the other types of business uh, model where we only offer key parts, our strategy is to actively participate in ecosystems led by the world's leading AI and cloud service providers. A recent illustration of this strategy is an announcement for the collaboration with Google, whereby running of Google's TensorFlow Lite for microcontrollers kernel, we provided our AI processor with CNN or convolutional neural network based SDK or software development kit for developers to generate deep learning inferences with video and voice commands data to boost overall system performance while consuming extremely low power. Being an official partner of Google's TensorFlow, we get to enjoy the enormous network of its ecosystem participants. <coughs> now, over a month after the announcement, uh, we are already receiving inquiries from large corporations and individual AI developers alike with application ideas covering a broad range of industries. We are very encouraged by the enthusiastic discussions about possible Wi-Fi applications that are taking place in various user groups for emerging AI uh, market ideas. Last but not least, we are working closely with other leading AI and cloud service providers worldwide to incorporate Wi-Fi Edge AI solutions into their ecosystems in an attempt to reach the broadest market coverage possible. We are extremely excited about these developments. Now turning to our CMOS image sensitive update. Due to the accelerated adoption of work from home and online education, Demand for a CMOS image sensor for notebook and IP camera will remain strong during the third quarter. Our industry first two-in-one CMOS image sensor has penetrated into the laptop ecosystem for the most stylish, super slim bezel design with three types of popular application features, namely RGB sensor for video conference, RGB IR sensor for Windows Hello facial recognition, and or partial low-power AI computer vision for human presence detection. We expect to see small volume in certain uh, premium notebook models in late 2020, with small volume expected in the coming years. For the traditional human vision segment, we also see strong demand in multimedia applications such as car recorders, surveillance, drones, home applications home appliances, and consumer electronics, among others. Lastly, on air course, we continue to focus on AR goggle devices and head-up display uh, for automotive. Many of our industry-leading customers have demonstrated their state-of-the-art products, including holographic SUV, AR glasses, and LiDAR system, with high-mass air quality technology inside. Our technology leadership and proven manufacturing expertise have made us a preferred partner for customers in these emerging markets and their ongoing engineering projects in AR goggles and SUV for automotive applications. For non drive IC business, we expect revenue to increase by low teens sequentially in the third quarter. That concludes my report for this quarter. Thank you for your interest in HiMax. We appreciate you joining today's call, and we are now ready to take questions. At this time, if you have a question, please press star to the number one on your telephone keypad. If you would like to withdraw your question, press the pound key. We ask that you please limit your question to two questions. And your first question comes from Tristan Guerra with Baird. Hi. Um, great, uh, great call. Would you be able to quantify the revenue impact of the foundry shortages on your uh, Q3 guidance? Foundry shortage. Um, 
is almost across the board, actually, uh, covering large and small displays, and even small screen sensors. Uh, what happens is uh, uh, for mature technologies, uh, very severely for 8 inch, but even for 12 inch, uh, with the 5G smartphone and other things, you know, coming up, um, fun the function capacity we believe will be a long term phenomenon. Uh, Foundry capacity shortage will be a long term phenomenon. Uh, so we are. <coughs> We made the right decision to uh, to develop uh, a new and major foundry partner being PSMC uh, in back in 2008, uh, 2018 for uh, GDI, and that was uh, among the best decisions uh, we made at the time. Because without that, we wouldn't have uh, been able to see the growth. But I think uh, foundry capacity shortage, unfortunately, and fortunately, in fact, it's here to stay, and it's not going away anytime soon, we believe. I don't know if there are any more specifics you want to know about. Okay, now that, that helps. Uh, I was just wondering, you know, by maybe what percentage um, higher your uh, revenue guidance would be if you were able to access, you know, all the capacity that you need. Much higher. Much, okay. much higher. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Great. But, uh, and then I don't know whether it's good news or bad news, but the fact is, this is going to be much higher, especially for smartphone and uh, and tablet TDDI. So then, let me just it, probably take this, take this opportunity to elaborate just a little bit. Again, the most badly impacted areas are smartphones and the tablet TDDI. Uh, uh, for both, we use the same pool of pale inch foundry. Uh, Q3, the shortage is severe, and Q4 also very, very bad. Now, uh, with the limited uh, capacity, you know, uh, available to us, we have to make a very difficult allocation choice. So, what and so one of of our of our Guiding principle for such uh, allocation choice is uh, we will give preferred allocation to where we are the main source or even the sole source. Uh, and uh, uh, if you follow this guidance, then inevitably our allocation will favor Tablet uh, uh, more than smartphone because with Tablet we have a very uh, large market share, and uh, we mentioned in our prepared remarks. Uh, we are the sole or dominant or major uh, vendor to literally all the known non Android uh, uh, tablet names. So, uh, if you look at uh, Q Q3, we uh, we expect to see a very strong growth for a small and uh, medium-sized market uh, together. Uh, uh, but the, but the, uh, uh, tablet growth is uh, higher than a smartphone. And if you look at Q4, uh, where uh, our allocation will be, will, will, be, will be skewed more, even more towards tablet because uh, the, the shortage is just pretty severe. So uh, Q4, in all likelihood, we'll see very, very strong tablet growth again for TDDI, but probably some decline in smartphone because of our allocation choices. Uh, overall, however, our allocated uh, total foundry capacity for TDDI 12 inch for Q4 will be higher than that for Q3. But certainly not enough for us to take up all the orders. I hope okay. that uh, any comment is helpful. Yes, definitely very, uh, very useful. And then uh, just the last question on, on the same topic is, uh, do you feel that your competition is facing the same issues and as such you don't expect market share shift because of um, you being impacted more from a capacity access standpoint than uh, your competitors? Yes, we believe so. And uh, based on my customers and some of the Key vendors who get to see many of my competitors' uh, 
production uh, or work in progress uh, status. Uh, we are probably one of the players whose position is uh, is better off compared to some of our peers. So yes, I think uh, it's a, it's an industry-wide phenomenon, and it hits uh, everybody uh, pretty badly, unfortunately. Okay. Thanks again. Very useful. Thank you, Tristan. Again, for any questions, please press star, then the number one on your telephone keypad. And your next question comes from Jerry Sue with Credit Suisse. Uh, yeah, hi. hi uh, thanks for taking my question. I'm um, just curious. Uh, I think for the uh, third quarter guidance, uh, it seems to be pretty strong, um, uh, but the gross margin still uh, uh, remain at the, the, the similar range or uh, versus the previous quarter. I'm just wondering um, because if, when we look at the um, gross margin profile of Hymax, um, in the past, it could go uh, to around um, at least a uh, low to mid 20s. I'm just wondering uh, why, um, you know, in the next uh, quarter, even with the, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the growth in the uh, top line, the uh, gross margin uh, is still not able to see a uh, more meaningful uh, uplift. Uh, that's a very good question, uh, Jerry. Um, <clears throat> Uh, firstly, uh, certainly it has, you know, everything to do with the product mix, right? And if you look at our gross margin across uh, some of our major segments, uh, uh, right now uh, the, the, the sectors enjoy, the product segments enjoy, enjoying the, high, the higher gross margins are uh, automotive drive IC, automotive display drive IC, um, and uh, WOO, WO, however, depending on uh, our capacity utilization, right? Um, and uh, and among the lower uh, cost margin segments include uh, smartphone. Um, and uh, a smartphone because of the rather severe comp competitive situation out there. So uh, choose. Q3 compared to Q2, we are not growing because uh, uh, Q3 similar to Q2, uh, the smartphone uh, as a percentage, especially for PVDI, is, uh, has grown remarkably from Q1, and that is actually the main reason to explain why the gross margin for both quarters are lower than uh, that of Q1. Also, in Q1, if you recall, our our WO shipment was very very strong, and uh, it declined rather significantly in Q2 and Q3, and again, as I said earlier, WO enjoyed uh, good growth margin, especially when the, the shipment is high and uh, therefore the capacity utilization is also high. Uh, and uh, and also the, the third reason I think is uh, is the is the rather sluggish automotive segment overall, and again, automotive historically and still now. And still, in any foreseeable future, will be, uh, you know, among the highest gross margin sectors uh, for us. Uh, so I, 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 so that that kind of explains the low gross, the unsatisfactory gross margin for Q2 and also Q3. I mentioned in my prepared remarks that uh, raising gross margin uh, is uh, now our short-term goal. Uh, and that uh, covers Q4 and certainly the whole next year. And I think we have uh, a fairly good uh, degree of confidence that uh, our gross margin will recover. I think uh, in general, foundry tightness, as you pointed out, uh, is in general uh, good for design house uh, gross margin. So um, I think we're going to take advantage of that firstly. And uh, <laughs> Also, uh, I mentioned earlier, uh, because of allocation decisions in Q4, Tech will grow uh, strongly, while 
uh, smartphone can even suffer a decline. So for that reason, I think uh, Q4 gross margin will also grow. Uh, among other reasons, and if you look at next year, we do have uh, some uh, new products in the pipeline, which upon mass production will enjoy very, very strong uh, gross margin, much, much higher than our corporate average. Stuff like uh, white size especially, and certainly 3D, uh, 3D sensing as well. Uh, okay, got it. And then uh, one follow-up on WO. Um, I, I'm just uh, wondering, uh, uh, you know, when can we see a more meaningful volume recovery for this business uh, going forward? For WO, uh, we, uh, we so far we have been uh, our business has been uh, very concentrated on one anchor customer. So for that reason, I'm afraid I, I really can't comment too much because that kind of implies anchor customer's activity, you know, rightly or wrongly, right? So and I, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, I think uh, what we are working very hard towards is uh, to diversify our customer base and application. And uh, and certainly, it's involved a lot of R&D and customer engagement, so the, the lead time uh, will be required. But um, uh, we talked about our TOF engagements, where we are engaged by, uh, you know, the 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 the, the smartphone and customers, uh, uh, the world's leading sensor vendors, and uh, some of the world's leading. Uh, Laser vendors. So we are kind of working together, trying to, you know, put together some good solutions, especially for enjoy market, right? Uh, so, you know, exactly that is going to happen. I can't really say because it's up to the the end customer, meaning the smartphone makers, to decide. But I can tell you, you know, we are making exciting progress. Uh, can we, you know, see? Some volume production next year, possibly, but uh, nothing is certain, you know, in the pipeline yet. I have to say, uh, but I can also say the, the 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 development and also the performance thereby uh, is is, uh, is, uh, is is looking very exciting. And we are also expanding our coverage to other applications, into including very notably automotive, uh, with which. You know, again, where we are working, you know, with uh, some of the leading, say, laser drivers, among others, you know, work together, try to penetrate. Uh, uh, to start with, for example, in automotive, in cabin uh, uh, sensing, in cabin, in cabin 3D sensing. So we are making good progress there as well. So, and also with the anchor customer, we have uh, quite a number of. Uh, Exciting but challenging uh, joint development projects. So, if you look, you know, slightly longer time horizon, I think this is a very, very exciting uh, area where we can tremendous, enjoy tremendous growth. But I just can't comment uh, much on the very short term. Okay, okay, I think that's good uh, for me. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. There are no further questions at this time. I will now hand the call back to Jordan Wu for closing remarks. Uh, as a final note, Eric Lee, our uh, Chief IRPR Officer, who will maintain investor marketing activities and continue to attend, continue to attend investor conferences. We will announce the details as they come about. Thank you, and have a nice day. That concludes today's conference. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect.